Chapter forty one of the Book of Job by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant for ever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another, they stick together, that they cannot be sundered. By his kneesings a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together, they are firm in themselves, they cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee, slingstones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble, he laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him, he spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot, he maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things, he is a king over all the children of pride. End of chapter 41《ハッピーオフレファイトン》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon.《ハッピーオフレファイトン》チャプター5 of Reason and Science。When man reasoneth, he does nothing else but conceive a sum total from addition of parcels, or conceive a remainder from subtraction of one sum from another. Which, if it be done by words, is conceiving of the consequence of the names of all the parts to the name of the whole, or from the names of the whole in one part to the name of the other part. And though in some things, as in numbers, besides adding and subtracting, men name other operations, as multiplying and dividing, yet they are the same, for multiplication is but adding together of things equal, and division but subtracting of one thing as often as we can. These operations are not incident to numbers only, but to all manner of things that can be added together, and taken one out of another. For as arithmeticians teach to add and subtract in numbers, so the geometricians teach the same in lines, figures, solid and superficial, angles, proportions, times, degrees of swiftness, force, power, and the like. The logicians teach the same in consequences of words, adding together two names to make an affirmation, and two affirmations to make a syllogism, and many syllogisms to make a demonstration. And from the sum or conclusion of a syllogism, they subtract one proposition to find the other. 
writers of politics add together passions to find men's duties, and lawyers, laws and facts to find what is right and wrong in the actions of private men. In some, in what matter soever there is place for addition and subtraction, there also is place for reason. And where these have no place, there reason has nothing at all to do. Out of all which we may define, that is to say determine, what that is which is meant by this word reason, when we reckon it amongst the faculties of the mind. For reason, in this sense, is nothing but reckoning, that is, adding and subtracting, of the consequences of general names agreed upon for the marking and signifying of our thoughts. I say marking them when we reckon by ourselves, and signifying when we demonstrate or approve our reckonings to other men. And as in arithmetic unpractised men must, and professors themselves may often, err and cast up false, so also in any other subject of reasoning the ablest, most attentive, and most practised men may deceive themselves, and infer false conclusions, not but that reason itself is always right reason, as well as arithmetic is a certain and infallible art. But no one man's reason, nor the reason of any one number of men, makes the certainty. No more than an account is therefore well cast up, because a great many men have unanimously approved it. And therefore, as when there is a controversy in an account, the parties must by their own accord set up for right reason, the reason of some arbitrator or judge, to whose sentence they will both stand, or their controversy must either come to blows, or be undecided, for want of a right reason constituted by nature. So is it also in all debates of what kind soever. And when men that think themselves wiser than all others clamour and demand right reason for judge, yet seek no more but that things should be determined by no other man's reason but their own, it is as intolerable in the society of men as it is in play after Trump is turned to use for Trump on every occasion that suit whereof they have most in their hand. For they do nothing else, that will have every of their passions, as it comes to bear sway in them, to be taken for right reason, and that in their own controversies bewraying their want of right reason by the claim they lay to it. The use and end of reason is not the finding of the sum and truth of one or a few consequences remote from the first definitions and settled significations of names, but to begin at these and proceed from one consequence to another. For there can be no certainty of the last conclusion without a certainty of all those affirmations and negations on which it was grounded and inferred. As when a master of a family, in taking an account, casteth up the sums of all the bills of expense into one sum, and not regarding how each bill is summed up by those that give them in account, nor what it is he pays for, he advantages himself no more than if he allowed the account in gross, trusting to every of the accountant's skill and honesty. So also, in reasoning of all other things, he that takes up conclusions on the trust of authors, and doth not fetch them from the first items in every reckoning, which are the significations of names settled by definitions, loses his labour, and does not know anything, but only believeth. When a man reckons without the use of words, which may be done in particular things, as when upon the side of any one thing, we conjecture what was likely to have proceeded, or is likely to follow upon it. If that which he thought likely to follow follows not, or that which he thought likely to have preceded it hath not preceded it, this is called error, to which even the most prudent men are subject. But when we reason in words of general signification, and fall upon a general inference which is false, though it be commonly called error, it is indeed an absurdity, or senseless speech. For error is but a deception, in presuming that somewhat is past, or to come of which, though it were not past or not to come, yet there was no impossibility discoverable. But when we make a general assertion, unless it be a true one, the possibility of it is inconceivable. And words whereby we conceive nothing but the sound are those we call absurd, insignificant, and nonsense. And therefore, if a man should talk to me of a round quadrangle, or accidents of bread and cheese, or immaterial substances, or of a free subject, a free will, or any free but free from being hindered by opposition, I should not say he were in an error, but that his words were without meaning, that is to say, absurd. I have said before, in the second chapter, that a man did excel all other animals in this faculty, that when he conceived anything whatsoever, he was apt to inquire the consequences of it, 
and what effects he could do with it. And now I add this other degree of the same excellence, that he can by words reduce the consequences he finds to general rules, called theorems, or aphorisms. That is, he can reason, or reckon, not only in number, but in all other things, whereof one may be added unto, or subtracted from another. But this privilege is allayed by another, and that is, by the privilege of absurdity, to which no living creature is subject, but man only. And of men, those are of all most subject to it that profess philosophy. For it is most true that Cicero saith of them somewhere, that there can be nothing so absurd, but may be found in the books of philosophers. And the reason is manifest, for there is not one of them that begins his ratiocination from the definitions or explications of the names they are to use, which is a method that hath been used only in geometry, whose conclusions have thereby been made indisputable. The first cause of absurd conclusions I ascribe to the want of method, in that they begin not their ratiocination from definitions, that is, from settled significations of their words, as if they could cast a count without knowing the value of the numeral words one, two, and three. And whereas all bodies enter into account upon diverse considerations, which I have mentioned in the precedent chapter, these considerations being diversely named, diverse absurdities proceed from the confusion and unfit connection of their names into assertions. And therefore the second cause of absurd assertions I ascribe to the giving of names of bodies to accidents, or of accidents to bodies, as they do that say, faith is infused, or inspired when nothing can be poured or breathed into anything but body, and that extension is body, that phantasms are spirits, etc. The third I ascribe to the giving of the names of the accidents of bodies without us to the accidents of our own bodies, as they do that say the colour is in the body, the sound is in the air, etc. The fourth to the giving of the names of bodies to names, or speeches, as they do that say that there be things universal, that a living creature is genus, or a general thing, etc. The fifth, to the giving of the names of accidents to names and speeches, as they do that say, the nature of a thing is its definition, a man's command is his will, and the like. The sixth, to the use of metaphors, tropes, and other rhetorical figures, instead of words proper. For though it be lawful to say, for example, in common speech, the way goeth, or leadeth, hither, or thither, the proverb says this or that, whereas ways cannot go, nor proverbs speak, yet in reckoning, and seeking of truth, such speeches are not to be admitted. The seventh, to names that signify nothing, but are taken up and learned by rote from the schools, as hypostatical, transubstantiate, consubstantiate, eternal now, and the like canting of schoolmen. To him that can avoid these things, it is not easy to fall into any absurdity, unless it be by the length of an account, wherein he may perhaps forget what went before. For all men by nature reason alike and well when they have good principles. For who is so stupid as both to make mistaken geometry, and also to persist in it when another detects his error to him? By this it appears that reason is not, as sense and memory, born with us, nor gotten by experience only, as prudence is but attained by industry, first in apt imposing of names, and secondly by getting a good and orderly method in proceeding from the elements, which are names, to assertions made by connection of one of them to another, and so to syllogisms, which are the connections of one assertion to another, till we come to a knowledge of all the consequences of names appertaining to the subject in hand, and that is it men call science. And whereas sense and memory are but knowledge of fact, which is a thing past and irrevocable, science is the knowledge of consequences, and dependence of one fact upon another, by which, out of that we can presently do, we know how to do something else when we will, or the like, another time. Because when we see how anything comes about, upon what causes and by what manner, when the like causes come into our power, we see how to make it produce the like effects. Children, therefore, are not endued with reason at all, till they have attained the use of speech, but are called reasonable creatures for the possibility apparent of having the use of reason in time to come. And the most part of men, though they have their use of reasoning a little way, as in numbering to some degree, yet it serves them to little use in common life, in which they govern themselves, some better, some worse, according to their differences of experience, quickness of memory, and inclinations to several ends 
but specially according to good or evil fortune, and the errors of one another. For as for science, or certain rules of their actions, they are so far from it that they know not what it is. Geometry they have thought conjuring, but for other sciences they who have not been thought the beginnings, and some progress in them, that they may see how they be acquired and generated, are in this point like children that, having no thought of generation, are made believe by the women that their brothers and sisters are not born, but found in the garden. But yet they that have no science are in better and nobler condition with their natural prudence than men that, by misreasoning, or by trusting them that reason wrong, fall upon false and absurd general rules. For ignorance of causes and of rules does not set men so far out of their way as relying on false rules, and taking for causes of what they aspire to those that are not so, but rather causes of the contrary. To conclude, the light of humane minds is perspicuous words, but by exact definitions first snuffed and purged from ambiguity. Reason is the pace, increase of science the way, and the benefit of mankind the end. And, on the contrary, metaphors and senseless and ambiguous words are like ignis fatui, and reasoning upon them is wandering amongst innumerable absurdities, and their end, contention and sedition, or contempt. As much experience is prudence, so is much science sapience. For though we usually have one name of wisdom for them both, yet the Latins did always distinguish between prudentia and sapientia ascribing the former to experience, the latter to science. But to make their difference appear more clearly, let us suppose one man endued with an excellent natural use and dexterity in handling his arms, and another to have added to that dexterity an acquired science of where he can offend, or be offended by his adversary, in every possible posture or guard. The ability of the former would be to the ability of the latter as prudence to sapience, both useful, but the latter infallible. But they that, trusting only to the authority of books, follow the blind blindly, are like him that, trusting to the false rules of a master of fence, ventures presumptuously upon an adversary that either kills or disgraces him. The signs of science are some certain and infallible, some uncertain. Certain, when he that pretendeth the science of anything can teach the same. That is to say, demonstrate the truth thereof, perspicuously to another. Uncertain, when only some particular events answer to his pretense, and upon many occasions prove so as he says they must. Signs of prudence are all uncertain, because to observe by experience, and remember all circumstances that may alter the success, is impossible. But in any business whereof a man has not infallible signs to proceed by, to forsake his own natural judgment, and be guided by general sentences read in authors, and subject to many exceptions, is a sign of folly, and generally scorned by the name of pedantry. And even of those men themselves that in councils of the commonwealth love to show their reading of politics and history, very few do it in their domestic affairs where their particular interest is concerned, having prudence enough for their private affairs, but in public they study more the reputation of their own wit than the success of another's business. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Leviathan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes Chapter 6 of the interior beginnings of voluntary motions, commonly called the passions, and the speeches by which they are expressed. There be in animals two sorts of motions peculiar to them, one called vital, begun in generation, and continued without eruption through their whole life, such as are the course of the blood, the pulse, the breathing, the concoction, nutrition, excretion, etc., to which motions there needs no help of imagination. The other is animal motion, otherwise called voluntary motion, as to go, to speak, to move any of our limbs, in such manner as is first fancied in our minds. That sense is motion in the organs and interior parts of man's body, caused by the action of the things we see, hear, etc., and that fancy is but the relics of the same motion, remaining after sense, 
has already been said in the first and second chapters. And because going, speaking, and the like voluntary motions depend always upon a precedent thought of whither, which way, and what, it is evident that the imagination is the first internal beginning of all voluntary motion. And though unstudied men do not conceive any motion at all to be there, where the thing moved is invisible, or the space it is moved in, for the shortness of it, invisible, yet that doth not hinder, but that such motions are. For let a space be never so little, that which is moved over a greater space, whereof that little one is a part, must first be moved over that. These small beginnings of motion within the body of man, before they appear in walking, speaking, striking, and other visible actions, are commonly called endeavor. This endeavor, when it is towards something which causes it, is called appetite, or desire, the latter being the general name, and the other oftentimes restrained to signify the desire of food, namely hunger and thirst. And when the endeavor is from ward something, it is generally called aversion. These words, appetite and aversion, we have from the Latins, and they both of them signify the motions, one of approaching, the other of retiring. So also do the Greek words for the same, which are orme and eforme. For nature itself does often press upon men these truths which afterwards, when they look for somewhat beyond nature, they stumble at. For the schools find in mere appetite to go, or move, no actual motion at all, but because some motion they must acknowledge, they call it metaphorical motion, which is but an absurd speech, for though words may be called metaphorical, bodies and motions cannot. That which men desire they are said to love, and to hate those things for which they have aversion. So that desire and love are the same thing, save that, by desire, we signify the absence of the object, by love, most commonly called the presence of the same. So also, by aversion, we signify the absence, and by hate, the presence of the object. Of appetites and aversions, some are born with men, as appetite of food, appetite of excretion, and exoneration, which may also and more properly be called aversions, from somewhat they feel in their bodies, and some other appetites, not many. The rest, which are appetites of particular things, proceed from experience and trial of their effects upon themselves or other men. For of things we know not at all, or believe not to be, we can have no further desire than to taste and try. But aversion we have for things, not only which we know have hurt us, but also that we do not know whether they will hurt us or not. Those things which we neither desire nor hate, we are said to condemn, contempt being nothing else but an immobility or contumacy of the heart in resisting the action of certain things, and proceeding from that the heart is already moved otherwise, by other more potent objects, or for want of experience of them. And because the constitution of a man's body is in continual motion, it is impossible that all the same things should always cause in him the same appetites and aversions, much less can all men consent in the desire of almost any one in the same object. But whatsoever is the object of man's appetite or desire, that is it for which he for his part calleth good, and the object of his hate and aversion evil, and of his contempt vile and inconsiderable. For those words of good, evil, and contemptible are ever used with relation to the person that useth them, there being nothing simply and absolutely so, nor any common rule of good and evil to be taken from the nature of the objects themselves, but from the person of the man, where there is no commonwealth, or in a commonwealth from the person that representeth it, or from an arbiter or judge, whom men disagreeing shall by consent set up, and make his sentence the rule thereof. The Latin tongue has two words whose significations approach to those of good and evil, but are not precisely the same, and those are pulchrum and turpe, whereof the former signifies that which by some apparent signs promiseth good, and the latter that which promiseth evil. But in our tongue we have not so general names to express them by. But for pulchrum we say in some things fair, in others beautiful, or handsome, or gallant, or honorable, 
or comely, or amiable, and for turpe, foul, deformed, ugly, base, nauseous, and the like, as the subject shall require, all other words, in their proper places, signify nothing else but the mean, or countenance, that promiseth good and evil. So that of good there be three kinds, good in the promise, that is pulchrum, good in effect, as the end desired, which is called jucundum, delightful, and good as the means, which is called utile, profitable, and as many of evil, for evil in promise, is that they call turpa, evil in effect, and end, is molestum, unpleasant, troublesome, and evil in the means, inutile, unprofitable, hurtful. As in sense that which is really within us is, I have said before, only motion, caused by the action of external objects but in appearance, to the sight, light, and color, to the ear, sound, to the nostril, odor, etc. So, when the action of the same object is continued from the eyes, ears, and other organs to the heart, the real effect there is nothing but motion, or endeavor, which consisteth in appetite or aversion to or from the object moving. But the appearance or sense of that motion is that we either call delight or trouble of mind. This motion, which is called appetite, and for the appearance of it delight and pleasure, seemeth to be a corroboration of vital motion, and a help thereunto, and therefore such things as caused delight were not improperly called jacunda, a jivando, from helping or fortifying, and the contrary, molesta, offensive, from hindering and troubling the motion vital. Pleasure, therefore, or delight, is the appearance or sense of good, and molestation or displeasure, the appearance or sense of evil. And consequently, all appetite, desire, and love is accompanied with some delight more or less, and all hatred and aversion with more or less displeasure and offense. Of pleasures, or delights, some arise from the sense of an object present, and those may be called pleasures of sense. The word sensual, as it is used by those only that condemn them, having no place till there be laws. Of this kind are all onerations and exonerations of the body, as also all that is pleasant, in the sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch. Others arise from the expectation that proceeds from foresight of the end, or consequence of things, whether those things in the sense please or displease, and these are pleasures of the mind of him that draweth in those consequences, and are generally called joy. In the like manner, displeasures are some in the sense, and called pain, others in the expectation of consequences, and are called grief. These simple passions, called appetite, desire, love, aversion, hate, joy, and grief, have their names for diverse considerations diversified. At first, when they one succeed another, they are diversely called from the opinion men have of the likelihood of attaining what they desire. Secondly, from the object loved or hated. Thirdly, from the consideration of many of them together. Fourth, from the alteration or succession itself. For appetite, with an opinion of attaining, is called hope. The same, without such opinion, despair. Aversion, with opinion of hurt from the object, fear. The same, with hope of avoiding that hurt by resistance, courage. Sudden courage, anger. Constant hope, confidence of ourselves. Constant despair, diffidence of ourselves. Anger, for great hurt done to another, when we conceive the same to be done by injury, indignation. Desire of good to another, benevolence good will, charity, if to man generally, good nature. Desire of riches, covetousness, a name used always in signification of blame, because men contending for them are displeased with one another's attaining them, though the desire in itself to be blamed, or allowed, according to the means by which those riches are sought. Desire of offense, or precedence, ambition, a name used also in the worst sense, for the reason before mentioned. Desire of things that conduce but a little to our ends, and fear of things that are but of little hindrance, pusillanimity. Contempt of little helps, and hindrances, magnanimity. Magnanimity in 
danger of death, or wounds, valor, fortitude. Magnanimity in the use of riches, liberality. Pusillanimity in the same, wretchedness, miserableness, or parsimony, as it is liked or disliked. Love of persons for society, kindness. Love of persons for pleasing the sense only, natural lust. Love of the same acquired from rumination, that is, imagination of pleasure past, luxury. Love of one singularly, with desire to be singularly beloved, the passion of love. The same, with fear that the love is not mutual, jealousy. Desire, by doing hurt to another, to make him condemn some fact of his own, revengefulness. Desire to know why, and how, curiosity, such as in no living creature but man, so that man is distinguished, not only by his reason, but also by this singular passion from other animals, in whom the appetite of food, and other pleasures of sense, by predominance, take away the care of knowing causes, which is a lust of the mind, that by a perseverance of delight in the continual and indefatigable generation of knowledge, exceedeth the short vehemence of any carnal pleasure. Fear of power invisible, feigned by the mind, or imagined from tales publicly allowed, religion, not allowed, superstition. And when the power imagined is truly such as we imagine, true religion. For without the apprehension of why, or what, panic terror, so called from the fables that make Pan the author of them, whereas, in truth, there is always in him so that feareth, first, some apprehension of the cause, though the rest run away by example, every one supposing his fellow to know why. And therefore this passion happens to none but in a throng, or multitude of people. Joy from apprehension of novelty, admiration, proper to man, because it excites the appetite of knowing the cause. Joy arising from imagination of a man's own power and ability is that exultation of the mind which is called glorying, which, if grounded upon the experience of his own former actions, is the same with confidence. But if grounded on the flattery of others, or only supposed by himself, for delight in the consequences of it, is called vainglory, which name is properly given, because a well-grounded confidence begetteth attempt, whereas the supposing power does not, and is therefore rightly called vain. Grief, from opinion of want of power, is called dejection of mind. The vainglory which consisteth in the feigning or supposing of abilities in ourselves, which we know are not, is most incident to young men, and nourished by the histories or fictions of gallant persons, and is corrected oftentimes by age and employment. Sudden glory is the passion which maketh those grimaces called laughter, and is caused either by some sudden act of their own that pleaseth them, or by the apprehension of some deformed thing in another, by comparison whereof they suddenly applaud themselves. And it is incident most to them that are conscious of the fewest abilities in themselves, who are forced to keep themselves in their own favor by observing the imperfections of other men and therefore much laughter at the defects of others, is a sign of pusillanimity. For of great minds one of the proper works is to help and free others from scorn, and compare themselves only with the most able. On the contrary, sudden dejection is the passion that causeth weeping, and is caused by such accidents as suddenly take away some vehement hope, or some prop of their power, and they are most subject to it that rely principally on helps external, such as are women and children. Therefore some weep for the loss of friends, others for their unkindness, others for the sudden stop made to their thoughts of revenge by reconciliation. But in all cases both laughter and weeping are sudden motions, custom taking them both away. For no man laughs at old jests, or weeps for an old calamity. Grief for the discovery of some defect of ability is shame, or the passion that discovereth itself in blushing, and consisteth in the apprehension of something dishonorable, and in young men is a sign of the love of good reputation, and commendable. In old men it is a sign of the same, but because it comes too late, not commendable. The contempt of good reputation is called impudence. Grief for the calamity of another is pity, and ariseth from the imagination that the calamity may befall himself, and therefore is called also compassion, and in the phrase of this present time a fellow-feeling, 
and therefore, for calamity arriving from great wickedness, the best men have the least pity, and for the same calamity, those have least pity that think themselves least obnoxious to the same. Contempt, or little sense of the calamity of others, is that which men call cruelty, proceeding from security of their own fortune. For, that any man should take pleasure in other men's great harms, without other end of his own, I do not conceive it possible. Grief for the success of a competitor in wealth, honor, or other good, if it be joined with endeavor to enforce our own abilities equal or exceed him, is called emulation, but joined with endeavor to supplant or hinder a competitor, envy. When in the mind of man appetites and aversions, hopes and fears, concerning one and the same thing, arise alternately, and diverse good and evil consequences of the doing or omitting the thing propounded come successfully into our thoughts, so that sometimes we have an appetite to it, sometimes an aversion from it, sometimes hope to be able to do it, sometimes despair or fear to attempt it, the whole sum of desires, aversions, hopes, and fears, continued till the thing be either done or thought impossible, is that we call deliberation. Therefore, of things past there is no deliberation, because manifestly impossible to be changed, nor of things known to be impossible, or thought so, because men know or think such deliberation in vain. But of things impossible, which we think possible, we may deliberate, not knowing it is in vain. And it is called deliberation, because it is a putting an end to the liberty we had of doing, or omitting, according to our own appetite or aversion. This alternate succession of appetites, aversions, hopes, and fears is no less in other living creatures than in man, and therefore beasts also deliberate. Every deliberation is then said to end when that whereof they deliberate is either done or thought impossible, because till then we retain the liberty of doing, or omitting, according to our appetite or aversion. In deliberation, the last appetite or aversion, immediately adhering to the action, or to the omission thereof, is that we call the will, the act, not the faculty of willing. And beasts that have deliberation must necessarily also have will. The definition of the will, given common name by the schools, that it is a rational appetite, is not good. For if it were, then could there be no voluntary act against reason. For a voluntary act is that which proceedeth from the will, and no other. But, if instead of a rational appetite, we shall say an appetite resulting from a precedent deliberation, then the definition is the same that I have given here. Will, therefore, is the last appetite in deliberating, and though we say in common discourse, a man had a will once to do a thing, that nevertheless he forbear to do, yet that is properly but an inclination, which makes no action voluntary, because the action depends not of it, but of the last inclination or appetite. For if the intervenient appetites make any action voluntary, then by the same reason all intervenient aversions should make the same action involuntary, and so one and the same action should be both voluntary and involuntary. By this it is manifest that, not only actions that have their beginning from covetousness, ambition, lust, or other appetites as to the thing propounded, but also those that have their beginning from aversion, or fear of those consequences that follow the omission, are voluntary actions. The forms of speech by which the passions are expressed are partly the same and partly different from those by which we express our thoughts. And first, generally, all passions may be expressed indicatively, as I love, I fear, I joy, I deliberate, I will, I command, but some of them have particular expressions, by themselves, which nevertheless are not informations, unless it be when they serve to make other inferences besides that of the passion they proceed from. Deliberation is expressed subjunctively, which is a speech proper to signify suppositions, with their consequences, as, if this be done, then this will follow, and differs not from the language of reasoning, save that reasoning is in general words, but deliberation, for the most part, is of particulars. The language of desire and aversion is imperative, as do this, forbear that, which, when the party is obliged to do or forbear, is a command, otherwise prayer or else counsel. The language of vainglory, of indignation, pity, and revengefulness, operative, 
but of the desire to know there is a peculiar expression called interrogative as what is it when shall it how is it done and why so other language of the passions i find none for cursing swearing reviling and the like do not signify as speech but as the actions of a tongue accustomed these forms of speech i say are expressions or voluntary significations of our passions but certain signs they be not because they may be used arbitrarily whether they that use them have such passions or not the best signs of passions present are either in the countenance motions of the body actions and ends or aims which we otherwise know the man to have and because in deliberation the appetites and aversions are raised by foresight of the good and evil consequences and sequels of the action whereof we deliberate the good or evil effect thereof dependeth on the foresight of a long chain of consequences of which very seldom any man is able to see to the end but for so far as a man seeth if the good in those consequences be greater than the evil the whole chain is that which writers call apparent or seeming good and contrarily when the evil exceedeth the good the whole is apparent or seeming evil so that he who hath by experience or reason the greatest and surest prospect of consequences deliberates best himself and is able when he will to give the best counsel unto others continual success in obtaining those things which a man from time to time desireth that is to say continual prospering is that men call felicity i mean the felicity of this life for there is no such thing as perpetual tranquillity of mind while we live here because life itself is but motion and can never be without desire nor without fear no more than without sense what kind of felicity god hath ordained to them that devoutly honour him a man shall no sooner know than enjoy being joys that now are as incomprehensible as the word of schoolmen beatifical vision is unintelligible the form of speech whereby men signify their opinion of the goodness of anything is praise that whereby they signify the power and greatness of anything is magnifying and that whereby they signify the opinion they have of a man's felicity is by the greeks called makarismos for which we have no name in our tongue and thus much is sufficient for the present purpose to have been said of the passions end of chapter six chapter seven of leviathan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Gesine Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes Chapter 7 Of the Ends or Resolutions of Discourse Of all discourse governed by desire of knowledge there is at last an end either by attaining or by giving over and in the chain of discourse wheresoever it be interrupted there is an end for that time. If the discourse be merely mental, it consists of thoughts that the thing will be and will not be, or that it has been and has not been alternately. So wheresoever you break off the chain of a man's discourse, you leave him in a presumption of it will be, or it will not be, or it has been, or has not been, all which is opinion, and that which is alternate appetite, in deliberating concerning good and evil, the same is alternate opinion in the inquiry of the truth of past and future. And as the last appetite in deliberation is called the will, so the last opinion in search of the truth of past and future is called the judgment, or resolute and final sentence of him that discourseth. And as the whole chain of appetites alternate, in the question of good or bad, is called deliberation, so the whole chain of opinions alternate, in the question of true or false, is called doubt. No discourse whatsoever can end in absolute knowledge of fact, past or to come. For as for the knowledge of fact, 
it is originally sense, and ever after memory. And for the knowledge of consequence, which I have said before is called science, it is not absolute, but conditional. No man can know by discourse that this or that is, has been, or will be, which is to know absolutely, but only that if this be, that is, if this has been, that has been, if this shall be, that shall be, which is to know conditionally, and that not the consequence of one thing to another, but of one name of a thing to another name of the same thing. And therefore, when the discourse is put into speech, and begins with the definitions of words, and proceeds by connection of the same into general affirmations, and these again into syllogisms, the end or last sum is called the conclusion, and the thought of the mind by it signified is that conditional knowledge, or knowledge of the consequence of words, which is commonly called science. But if the first ground of such discourse be not definitions, or if the definitions be not rightly joined together into syllogisms, then the end or conclusion is again opinion, namely of the truth of somewhat said, though sometimes in absurd and senseless words, without possibility of being understood. When two or more men know of one and the same fact, they are said to be conscious of it one to another, which is as much as to know it together. And because such are fittest witnesses of the facts of one another, or of a third, it was and ever will be reputed a very evil act for any man to speak against his conscience, or to corrupt or force another so to do, insomuch that the plea of conscience has been always hearkened unto very diligently in all times. Afterwards men made use of the same word metaphorically for the knowledge of their own secret facts and secret thoughts, and therefore it is rhetorically said that the conscience is a thousand witnesses. And last of all, men, vehemently in love with their own new opinions, though never so absurd and obstinately bent to maintain them, gave those their opinions also that reverenced name of conscience, as if they would have it seem unlawful to change or speak against them and so pretend to know they are true, when they know at most, but that they think so. When a man's discourse beginneth not at definitions, it beginneth either at some contemplation of his own, and then it is still called opinion, or it beginneth at some saying of another, of whose ability to know the truth, and of whose honesty in not deceiving, he doubteth not, and then the discourse is not so much concerning the thing as the person, and the resolution is called belief and faith. Faith in the man, belief both of the man and of the truth of what he says. So that in belief are two opinions, one of the saying of the man, the other of his virtue. To have faith in or trust to, to believe a man, signify the same thing, namely an opinion of the veracity of the man. But to believe what is said signifieth only an opinion of the truth of the saying. But we are to observe that this phrase I believe in, as also the Latin credo in, and the Greek piseno eis, are never used but in the writings of divines. Instead of them, in other writings are put, I believe him, I trust him, I have faith in him, I rely on him. And in Latin, credo ili, fido ili, and in Greek, piseno anto. And that this singularity of the ecclesiastic use of the word hath raised many disputes about the right object of the Christian faith. 
but by believing in, as it is in the creed, is meant not trust in the person, but confession and acknowledgement of the doctrine. For not only Christians, but all manner of men, do so believe in God, as to hold all for truth they hear him say, whether they understand it or not, which is all the faith and trust can possibly be had in any person whatsoever. But they do not believe the doctrine of the creed, from whence we may infer that when we believe any saying, whatsoever it be, to be true, from arguments taken, not from the thing itself, or from the principles of natural reason, but from the authority and good opinion we have of him that hath said it, then is the speaker or person we believe in or trust in, and whose word we take, the object of our faith, and the honour done in believing is done to him only. And consequently, when we believe that the scriptures are the word of God, having no immediate revelation from God himself, our belief, faith and trust is in the church, whose word we take and acquiesce therein. And they that believe that which a prophet relates unto them in the name of God, take the word of the prophet, do honour to him, and in him trust and believe, touching the truth of what he relateth, whether he be a true or a false prophet. And so it is also with all other history, for if I should not believe all that is written by historians of the glorious acts of Alexander or Caesar, I do not think the ghost of Alexander or Caesar had any just cause to be offended or anybody else but the historian. If Livy says the gods made once a cow speak, and we believe it not, we distrust not God therein, but Livy. So that it is evident that whatsoever we believe, upon no other reason than what is drawn from authority of men only and their writings, whether they be sent from God or not, is faith in men only. End of chapter 7 Recorded by Gesine in January 2007